with me. First Peter chapter 2 in your Bibles, right toward the very, very back of your Bible, almost the last book of your Bible. Uh, first and Second Peter, First, Second, Third John, Jude, and Revelation, right at the end. First Peter, there's two books Peter wrote, and uh, First Peter chapter 2. We'll just read a few verses, and I will hurry. Thank you for your faithfulness. Uh, coming to church, giving. We're in a sick world, not just morally. I mean, we're sick. There's a bunch of sick people. <laughs> we are, uh, our school principal has just abandoned us. I don't know where he is. I'm amazed Mrs. Beale is still alive, but, but we've got sick people all over, and if you're well, thank God for it, and, and I hope you can stay well. We've got a lot to do. Pray for the kids going to camp. We definitely need prayer. Um, we are uh, we're fast approaching a um, an atheist church. We just expect if we do A and B and C, then D will result. And uh, let me just tell you, the things of God don't happen without God. Doesn't happen in the flesh. Um, child rearing doesn't happen because you're smart and you read child rearing books. It happens because you know God. Because I go around the room here and tell you stories of families where all their kids are just amazing and the parents were child rearing buffoons i wouldn't tell you who they were but uh, i mean it's god now you should know some principles about child rearing but i'll tell you what it's god except the lord build the house they labor in vain that build it and the school thing we're not talking about education tonight we are the off and on the rest of the month but but um you're not gonna you're not gonna put kids in a christian school and think that's gonna replace prayer you want to, you're shooting at the wrong king. To bring up a sermon from the mid 80s of Dr. Hiles. Uh, uh, throwing your kid into a Christian school without a home that's holy and prayer filled is you just as well throw a pig in the pool to get it cleaned up. It's still a pig. And uh, we, need to, we need God in a desperate, desperate way tonight. Um, ending this theme on stewardship, I'd like you to read 1 Peter 2 with me. We'll start reading in verse 4. Let's stand for a moment. If you make sure your phones are off, if you need to slip out for any reason, now would be a good time to do that. And just have a seat in the back, then you're not a distraction. We don't have but a few minutes tonight. I'm going to start reading in chapter 2, verse 4. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God, and this is our theme, and precious. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer uh, up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. A stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Talking about Jesus. He is, well, he's a stone of stumbling to the unbeliever, to the, the person who wants to pretend there is no God. He will cause him to stumble and fall and make a mess of him. A rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word. They got a problem with the Bible? They got a problem with Jesus. Even them that stumble, notice that in verse 8, his word, at the word. Uh, these people are trying to mess with your Bible, they're trying to mess up your Savior. And a very, very a holy, sacred thing. But in the end of verse 8, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Verse 9, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And let's pray together. Father, would you meet with us tonight? I need hours and days and weeks to even begin to address a subject like this. But as we think of all that we have when we received Christ, the song the choir sang, merciful Savior, come into my heart, or rule in my heart, that we could have in our presence the Spirit of God, the Son of God. It's beyond comprehension. The one who made the stars could live inside me. We come tonight asking for help as we try to grasp just a little bit the responsibility of being a good steward of not just the grace of our God, but Father, the Son that you gave for us. Help us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. You'll notice the end of verse 4. It says, He was disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. God's Son, I sat there watching 
Josh and Natasha sing and thought how thankful I was that God gave me a son that loved God and um, grateful that he's alive and how God willfully designed the torture and abuse and murder of his own son. I mean, just think about that. Think about one of your child, children. Think about how you would plan the shame, embarrassment, torture, and death of your own child. And that's what the Father did for you and for me. And, and this Son of God in verse 4 that was disallowed indeed of men was precious to God. And he says in verse 8, Wherefore also it is contained in the Scriptures, Behold, I lay in Zion, a chief cornerstone elect. And again, he says he's precious. A precious Savior. To God in verse 4 and to God in verse 6. But in verse 7, Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. And tonight, I want to get you just to think, and this is not going to be at all a bombastic sermon, but I wish there's a way I could pour in some of God's wonder into your heart. Stewardship is taking anything you have and treating it as God would want you to treat it. That's your marriage, your children, your country, your church, your earthly possessions. Everything we have came from God. None of us got anything because we're so good, because there's, there's people all over the world better than us that don't have all the things, talking about physical things that we enjoy. James says every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights. Uh, God gave you everything good that you have. And when we think about what God's given us, um, our money, our freedom, well, have we stewarded our freedom in America? Just how much have we used our freedom? What an honor to vote, to go door to door witnessing. Uh, just, just a privilege to go and, uh, and to get a job and to print a newspaper and to write a book and to publish a book. You know, those are things that are unique to much from, most of the world can't do those things. We have given so much, when we think about stewardship, God gives me something and I am to use that something in a way that would honor and glorify him in the way he wants a steward isn't an owner a steward is someone entrusted with what the owner gave to us a virtuous wife is from the lord proverb says so my wife has been given to me from god and i am to treat her like the owner wants me to treat her and everything in life is that way. Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is his reward. I'm to treat my children the way God wants them treated. And all the things that you and I look at in life as our own, they're not our own. God gave them to us and, and he lets us have them or lets us steward them, but they're from him. And when I think of the things God gave me, I cannot go beyond John 3, 16, that God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. God gave his son. And if I'm to steward everything God gave me, I think I need to steward the person of Jesus. He said later in the Gospel of John, that he said, I will come and make my abode with you. He's going to come live with you. That means tomorrow on the way to work, Jesus, if you're saved, Jesus is with you. It means tomorrow at work, as you're dealing with the crazies in the world, he's with you. That means you're at camp this week, teenagers. He's with you. If you're saved, he's with you in that cabin up there. And, and, uh, and he knows how it smells if you're in a guy's cabin. Um, all the things that we go through, he's with us. Ask yourself today, what have I done with Jesus? What have I done with the knowledge of the Son of God when most of the world knows nothing of Jesus Christ? What have you done with him? When most of the world's never had a Bible, the written word of God, the word, this, was made flesh and dwelt among us, and that's Jesus. What have you done with the word that God gave you? What have you done with the fact of Christ's atoning death? What have we done with that? What, what have we done with Jesus? The fact that in a few minutes we're going to share the bread and the juice, and if you're saved and, and uh, you want to, this is, this is for you to take a moment and you hold that little piece of bread, and for these 2,000 years, it's been a picture of the, of the tortured, shredded body of Jesus, his flesh that was shredded with a cat of nine tails. And that night he was crucified, or before he was arrested, 
he broke this bread and he gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. It's not his literal flesh, it was figurative because in a moment he said, the cup, well, the cup's not his blood, the cup was what held it, but as he passed that cup around, this cup is the New Testament, my blood. This do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And that, uh, you know, the song Brother Ron had us sing a moment ago, when I survey the wondrous cross, to survey, to step back and look at that cross on which the prince of glory died. My richest gain I count but lost. And pour contempt on all my pride. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow me, or thorns compose so rich a crown? That song, we'll look at it at the end of the message, but, but that simple song, look at the cross. During, during the Lord's Supper, I always stop and picture myself at the foot of the cross. I can't even in my mind look up. I have to have my head down. What did Jesus do for you and for me? Can we go to the empty tomb where Mary was? And the body was gone and she's weeping because he's gone. And she didn't think he was alive. He was gone. She was crying because she couldn't find him. And she thought some one of the hateful people took him from there and threw his body somewhere. And Jesus comes up behind her and and uh, interrupts her weeping and she thought he was the gardener and she said where have you taken him I'll go get him she loved Jesus and he called her name Mary and she recognized the way he said her name and her name means so much in it something that Jesus knows your name Amen. he knows you and she turned to and fell at his feet and fell to grab his feet and he said touch me not I have not yet ascended to my father what Mary something and by the way this isn't his mother Mary most people don't think it is anyways seven Marys in the Bible trying to figure them all out he said you got to figure it out no it's Mary you figure it out she's the only one that saw him before he went up to heaven because just a little bit later in the Bible he stops uh, he was in the upper room and lets them handle him. He stopped some people on the, on the road and lets them touch him. But she, she couldn't touch him. He'd not taken that, that blood, that blood that had poured out of his body. And the high priest had to take the physical blood and bring it to the mercy seat and sprinkle it in the Holy of Holies. And from the laver where the clay was cleansed into the Holy of Holies where he sprinkled the blood, he couldn't touch anything that would defile him. And he couldn't, certainly couldn't touch a human being, the sinner. And that blood would have been defiled and would have all been shed in vain. And Jesus went to the Father, presented the blood at the mercy seat, redeemed all of man, kept, all of kept man, and he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. And, and the world had a chance from that day on. Amen. And are we, Amen. let me just give you a handful of thoughts. First of all, are we worshiping that matchless name? Do you worship? I don't mean go to church. I don't mean repeat a silly, meaningless prayer that someone wrote that you don't think about. You can go over your grocery list while you recite it. The Bible says the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run to it. To what? The name. The name of the Lord. I, I go through names of God over and over and over in my time of prayer and worship. And I just go through it and, and understand a new Christian, somebody who's not saved yet, they don't, they don't understand worship. But worship is, worship is taking time with your words and your, your body posture and your spirit, your mind, and your heart and, and trying to take somebody and lift them up to where they belong. And how can we lift the name of Christ up high enough? How can we make him big enough? How can we exalt him enough? How can we speak good enough? How could a human vocabulary bring enough adjectives to describe how good our Lord Jesus Christ is? Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. Do you worship? I mean, is there ever any time when you stop everything and do nothing but talk about how good he is? Secondly, are we awed at his power and his sovereignty? He was in the garden about to be arrested. He's with the disciples. Judas comes with the People that were so crooked, they wouldn't talk to him during the day or try to arrest him during the day. They came at night. 
caught him in a place of prayer. Jesus stepped out and said, whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he just said, I am he. And there's such authority and power, they all fell down. Yeah, that's right. By the way, the day's coming, everybody's going to fall down again before him. Yeah. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Have you ever just stopped everything long enough to say, you're God, whatever you want. I don't like what my child's going through, but you're God. I don't like the economy I'm having to deal with, but you're God. I don't like my wife or my husband's health, but you're God. I don't like the mess this world's in, but you're God, and you're going to be God. I'm going to trust you. Amen. Have we allowed him to be God in our lives? Amen. Or do we fight him at every turn? Have we been awed at his power? Have we humbled ourselves and surrendered ourselves to his will as he did to his father's will? When he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Do we worship his matchless name? Do we stand at all in his power? Thirdly, are we grateful that we can speak his name freely? Do you know how many people in the world would love to talk about Jesus that can't? Body parts cut off, ears cut off, tongues cut out, noses cut off, hands cut off, fingers cut off, just by naming the name of Jesus. And you and I could walk down the street screaming his name and people think you're nuts, but you could do that. Do we talk about the Lord Jesus Christ? Do we speak his name openly? Or are we embarrassed? I don't know where I was the other day. I wish I'd have remembered. I, was, I think it was at a store, but it could have been a restaurant. But I think it was at a store somewhere and somebody's helped me look for something. And, and the, 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 the uh, employee, I, they found it, whatever, I forget what it was. And, and they said, well, praise the Lord or amen or something. And then you can tell they caught themselves because <laughs> you never know what kind of trouble you're going to get on the job. And I just responded in kind. You know, he said, amen. I said, praise the Lord. It's like, oh, good. I won't get fired for that one. <laughs> it ought to be natural. Right. Talking good about God ought to be the most natural thing in the world. Yeah, somebody says, wow, you got great kids. Say, God made them. Isn't he awesome? You know, somebody says, wow, you, your dress sure looks pretty. Isn't God good to give me such nice things? Why don't we give God credit? Sure like your hair the way it is. Isn't God good to put hair on our heads? <laughs> Some of them. Let me give you a few things that should cultivate our love for God. I'm not going over here. Most of you know I love, I love hymns. I'm not against a few choruses now and then. I'm against them dominating us. But I love hymns. The, the bookmark I just gave you, those are two songs. You ought to read through those. I've read them a dozen times since I found them a couple weeks ago. And you look, that one of William Carey's convert, read through that picture. A convert 200 years ago in India. Somebody, somebody took off and left home knowing they'll probably never come back to a culture and a world so alien. How many people did he witness to before that guy got saved? And that guy gave, I mean, that guy penned those words. What rich, deep, beautiful words. Songs are so good. The name of Jesus is so sweet. I love his music to repeat. It makes my joys full and complete the precious name of jesus see if you get good songs in your head it'll help you learn to worship i love the name of him whose heart knows all my griefs and bears a part who bids all anxious fears depart i love the name of jesus I, that name i fondly love to hear it never fails my heart to cheer its music dries the falling tear exalt the name of jesus no word of men can ever tell how sweet the name i love so well oh let his praises ever swell oh praise the name of jesus look look at your hymnal for a minute would you do that i'm not going to be long tonight i i want you to understand music will help you worship god look at page 165 if you don't have a hymnal then just listen hey Page 165, I, I don't know how many hundreds of times I'll lay on my face or on my knees go through the lyrics of this song. Oh, worship the King, 
all glorious above, and gratefully sing his wonderful love. Our shield, he has one of the names of God. And the name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous run to it and are safe. Our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. If you ever want to know what's wrong with the newer chorus and 7-Eleven songs, it's that. They've got no majesty. They've got no beauty. They've got no depth. They've got no meter and rhyme. They've got no, no thought that dwelt deep in the, in the language of men to find the perfect word and the richest words. Oh, tell of his might and sing of his grace, whose robe is the light, whose canopy space. Isn't that something? I just love that. His robe is the light, his canopy is space, his chariots of wrath. The deep thunder clouds form and dark is his path. On the wings of a storm, thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the light, it streams from the hills, it descends to the plain and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. Frail children of dust, that's us. And feeble as frail, that's us too. In thee, capital T, do we trust, nor find thee to fail. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end, our maker, our defender, our redeemer, and friend. You know what? How long did it take to read that? Could you just do that once a week? Just get on your knees and read those, wor those words to God. Turn over to page 157. We need, we need a revival of worship. God gave you Jesus. You know what you're supposed to do? Worship him. Worship. That is a command of God. And one of the things that will help you learn to steward the Son of God, to worship Him, is good music. One Page 157. Come now, Almighty King. Help us, Thy name to sing. Help us to praise. Father, all glorious, or all victorious, come and reign over us, ancient of days. Verse 2, come now incarnate word, gird on thy mighty sword. Our prayer attend, come and thy people bless, and give thy word success. Spirit of holiness, on us descend. Man, these songs, let me show you one more, 160. You gotta, I we don't have time to go through all these verses, but let me just show you one more. On page 160, crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but his own. You, get, you, you bow your head in prayer and read those words to God. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake my soul and sing of him who died for thee and hail him as thy matchless king through all eternity. Crown him the Lord of love, behold his hands, his side, rich wounds yet visible above in beauty glorified. No angel in the sky can fully bear that sight, but downward bend his wandering high at mysteries so bright. Crown him the Lord of life who triumphed o'er the grave, who rose victorious to the strife for those he came to save. His glories now we sing, who died and rose on high, who died eternal life to bring, and lives that death may die. That'll replace all the rock music. Taylor Swift could never do anything like that. Madonna could never read those words, let alone write them or sing them. Boy, get, get good music. How are you stewarding Jesus? Hey, is Jesus like your grandma's china, beautiful and wonderful and in the corner and you never look at her or think about it? Is Jesus like your old set of golf clubs? Just, just what are you doing with Jesus in your life? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come into him and sup with him and he with me. Do you know the day you got saved, Christ came to live inside you and he wants to walk with you, the song writes, and it says, and talk with you. He wants to be near to you. He wants to embrace you and love you. He wants to be your comfort and sorrow, your strength and weakness, your love when you're lonely. He wants to be your joy in times of sorrow. Do we walk with him? Or is he like your coffee? You get a cup in the morning, you read a few verses and go on through your day and forget him. One of the ways to develop that closeness 
of stewardship of the relationship with Christ is good music. Another one is the scriptures. There's not enough time for us to go through the scriptures, but let me just read a few verses. I use a lot of scripture when I pray. I take a lot of time, and, 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 and for me, my, my time with God typically will be worship. That's all about him. And then it will be thanksgiving, and that's what he's done for me. And praise what, he's, what he is and what he's done, and that's kind of a part of worship. Thanksgiving just gets in there because he's been so good to me. And then get over down here and I get to my intercession, which means I'm praying for many of you. Every time I see Miss, Mrs. Lopez come in, I don't know where Oscar and Delia are. I don't know how many hundreds of times I've prayed for her. When I see her walking in here, I think, God is so good to us. And others, Gary Jefferson, I mean, you talk about at death's door, he would, he had one foot through the door. <laughs> oh my, and, and how easy it is to praise God and thank God. But intercession is that time to pray for us. And you know what, down here at the end is my prayer list for things, you know what, I just don't pray much for me. I don't have time to get to me. And God is so good and worthy of our praise and our worship and worthy of our thanksgiving of how good he's been. He's worthy of our, of our, our, of our adoration of the glories of the world and what he's done. You want to know how do you, how do you do those things? Look around and you've heard me talk about it, but honestly, think about your hands and your eyes and your ears and your, your heart beating. Think about, you know, today, honest, I was sitting here today thinking about jellyfish. You ever see jellyfish? Those are the most wonderful things. I was at an aquarium up in Monterey, and they had a, 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 a dark room and a black light on these jellyfish in this huge aquarium, thousands of them. And you just look at it thinking, God is incredible. God is, look, a, you ever look at a seahorse or a whale or a, a sea urchin? You ever, I take things and put them in sea urchins and watch them go, oh, what a great thing. God made all that stuff. God made babies. And you go to the nursery and look at these newborn babies. And I didn't get to introduce him this morning. One of our, one of our couples sat right back there, had their newborn in the, in the service. And I think, man, I just, you look at a baby's fingers. They're just, a, and those doctors will tell you to kill those things if they don't fit just right into your little cultural circle. What a God. And you know what? My needs are pretty low on the time requirements here. I'll pray for money for our Christian school. I'll pray for money to put our kids in, a, in our Christian school. I'll pray for our camp. But I think about, take time to look at the world. Look at the mountains and the trees and the plants. Look at a cactus. Man, look at, God, this is an incredible world. Quickly, scriptures will help you. Scriptures will help you. Get the right scriptures. I like verses like 1 Samuel 2, 3 in Hannah's prayer after she was promised the baby. She said, talk no more exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. I like that. Just shut up before God. For God is a God of knowledge. And by him actions are weighed. Isn't that good? Boy, with all of her heartbreak and her desires, when God came to answer her prayer, she said, you know what? We just need to be quiet. Because he's God. In Revelation 15, 4 who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are manifest. And a little later in Revelation 19, I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude, and the voice of many waters, and the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. And you go through the scriptures of God's glory. Thou art worthy, O Lord, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are created. Those verses, read it, think about it, and go before God with your open Bible and read those verses back to God. I spent time today going through the Hallelujah Chorus. You've all heard it. It's not so bad hearing it. Try reading the music on that. Man, there's seven different stands. I can't figure that out. I'll just turn on the tape and listen to it. God is amazing. I'd like to encourage you to talk to him. Do you go through the day and never talk to him? You're in traffic tomorrow. Do you talk to him? You're on your way to eat lunch. Do you talk to him? You gals getting your kids' lunches ready tomorrow. Do you talk to him? How about before bed tonight? You're getting clothes ready for tomorrow, so it's not so frustrating tomorrow morning. Do you talk to him? How about take your time to talk to him about your children going to camp? Do you talk to him? How about do you talk about him? 
Brittany and Gabe Valdez back here. And, well, what do you think if Gabe never talked about his wife? She would have a spirit problem. She's a good girl, but she's not that good. You want him to think about you, right, Brent? Yeah, she does. And when they were dating and engaged, if, if he never told, you know, she shows up and, and somebody says, who's this, Gabe? And he says, oh, it's my fiance. And they said, oh, we didn't even know you had a girlfriend. Uh, that would not go over real well. How do you think Jesus feels? Does anybody know you're a Christian? Has he ever talked about? Talk to him, then talk about him. We're talking about stewarding the person that God gave to die for you. Just, I have no idea how to explain our obligation. Our money is easy. We owe him. But how do you steward a relationship to a person? You ought to boast of him. You ought to brag on him. Oh, my soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. In God we boast all the day long and praise thy name forever. There ought to be a boasting in our vocabulary about God. We ought to brag about God. We ought to talk good about God. I mean, I don't care where you are. Before the heathen, before the believers, God, God's name ought to be bragged on. Amen. If I'm to be a steward of the knowledge of Christ, how can I not witness to others about him? How can I not... If, if I am to be a steward of Jesus, if you were to look at this thing Jesus, God gave me his own son inside me, and I'm to be a good steward of God's precious son, how can I not support missionaries going around the world to talk about him? How can we do that? You look at that offering envelope, and it, it says missions, and that's the way we support our missions. If you never put any money in there, then you're putting nothing in missions unless you're doing it on your own, which, of course, you could. And I, I just can't look at that slot without putting some money in it. All the missionaries I know across the world trying to struggle through life and serve God. How, if I'm the steward, my relationship to Jesus Christ, how could I not read my Bible? How could we go days without reading our Bible and steward what Jesus did for us? If I'm to be a steward, how could I not rear my family to please God? How could, how could I not bring them to church with me? Now, again, I'm not going to, I told somebody this morning, I'm not going to make my wife do anything. My wife's an adult. She can do what she wants. You know, my kids are going to church with me. And if my wife didn't like it, it's just her problem. She could put it in whatever pipe she wants and smoke it with whatever else she's smoking. My kids are going to church with me. I am to steward the relationship with Christ, and I have the, the Son of God who died for me, and I'm not about to have a house he gave me, and food he gave me, and a job he gave me, and a car he gave me, and food in the cupboard he gave me, and clothes in the closet he gave me, and cupboards on the walls he gave me, and carpet on the floors he gave me, and not have my kids in his church. Good, Ain't going to happen. Now, they may get big enough they choose to not go and go somewhere else, and all right, they can get into somebody else's roof, somebody else's carpet, and all that stuff. How can I not lead my family to Christ? How can I not do my best to get the hearts of young people? We talk about Christian education. All that Jesus is, how could we sit over here enjoying Jesus Christ and let this valley with who knows how many thousands of young people and have them not know about Jesus. How do we do that? Wherefore, it's contained in the scriptures, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious. To God, his son is very, very precious. Unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious. I'll go back to, if you want to turn over there to page five in your hymnal and I'll close. When I survey Page five, right of that gold, uh, the, not the gold book, the red hymnal, whatever color, blue hymnal, I don't know what color yours is, mine's red. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most I sacrificed them to his blood. I, I worry sometimes. I hear some preachers talking more about sports than I do Jesus. 
I, got, I, I worry about it. Yes. We're in a country where some preacher's wives know more about Pinterest than they do the Bible. Amen. Yeah, come on. I don't even know what Pinterest is. If you can't eat it, I don't want it. Verse 3, see from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet? Or thorns compose so rich a crown? How could we exalt the name of an athlete and not exalt the name of a Savior? Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands that love demands my soul, my life, my all. What are you doing with Jesus? Is he in a little corner of your world or is he your world? Is Jesus just some little stopping point or is he your friend day in and day out? And you know, no one can read that. No one can sense that. No one knows, but God knows. And I want to urge you tonight if you're going to be a steward at all, be a steward of, the, of, the, of a relationship to Jesus Christ. If there was any way I could, I could force feed loving God on you, I, I don't know how to do it. I wish we could learn to love him. I wish we could just act like we love him. Say, I don't know how to love him. Just start doing things that loving people do. Write him a note each morning. Write a note, dear Jesus, you are wonderful. Tape it to the dash of your car. Say, why would I do that? You like people writing you notes. We're made in the image of God. Well, I, I wish more than anything else, we would be a church that loved Jesus Christ. If we just loved him, everything else would fall into place. I really would. Let's pray. Father, help us tonight. I wish I was smarter. I wish I was more articulate. <laughs> The Holy Spirit, you are the one who speaks to hearts. And if you are limited by human vocabulary, you are in trouble here. But I pray that you would speak to hearts and draw people to you. And these young people, we've got quite a few seniors. In the coming months, they're going to be making decisions about college, and work, and relationships. Oh, may they love you supremely. for our married couples, that there would be a humble love for you that would cause them to love their spouse and be good to one another, that, that all the mean words and all the unkindness would be thrown out of the home because we love Jesus. And that as parents, we would be passionate about our children loving you. That we'd be passionate about loving the sick and the hurting and, and three of our finest, most inner circle people tonight wrestling with cancer, Lord, that they would know your love and your closeness and that they would be loved and that in prayer people would come before the throne of grace on their behalf. Lord, teach us to love, but most of all, teach us to love you. May we not go through hours and hours and never think about you. Help us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand for a moment. We'll have an invitation.